This presentation is about adding uh, gases and different types of process equipment into buildings. This is a um, this is a call out I go on a lot. The challenge is, is that we're doing some things that we don't totally understand with some of these gases and specifically uh, probably one of the ones that's most common is hydrogen. And so I'll hit on hydrogen a bit today uh, as we go through this, but um, this really doesn't matter whether it's hydrogen or any other gas. If the gas is toxic or flammable in any nature, uh, or it is has the ability to displace the oxygen and become an asphyxiant, then um, we need to start making some better decisions about what we're doing. I walk into an amazing amount of buildings. Uh, I was at a, a, a facility up in Detroit um, earlier this year, and uh, the facility's brought in a lot of equipment, and they're pumping hydrogen in at a unbelievably high pressure. Uh, because they're basically testing engines um, burning 100% hydrogen. And um, it, it's, it's great. I love the research. I love what's going on. But the building wasn't designed for that. They just run the risk of, quite frankly, reducing the building to rubble. And they've got some things to do to fix it. So this is basically a presentation that's coming out of a lot of those meetings and a lot of the work we've done. Uh, we do these projects all over the world. So a little bit about me. Uh, I am a technical consultant. I focus mostly on controls. I'm a physicist by education, a nuclear physicist by education, believe it or not. Um, I have a computer technology degree and an international MBA. So I have basically about 20 years of experience working on control systems, specking them on jobs, uh, programming things, and uh, doing just about everything under the sun that has to do with industrial automation software or control systems. Uh, I spent five years as the vice president of a Honeywell business uh, working in a slightly different control system era or world. I uh, spent some time at Ultra Electronics in Washington, D.C., which is a British company. Uh, I am a cybersecurity guy. I have a global industrial cybersecurity um, uh, professional certificate. And I'm co-author of the Security PHA Review, which was a result of a cybersecurity project I was doing in a refinery off the coast of Italy. So what does that have to do with what we're talking about today? Well, um, I've been teaching classes online for fire and gas mapping for a long time. And I'm the guy who usually goes out when somebody says, eh, we are not real sure what's going on here. Let's talk. To get a hold of somebody at the company, info at connexus.com. And uh, you can also go to the website and fill out any one of the contact forms, and those will come in uh, to Chris, who's actually on the phone, and he'll make sure the right people get in touch with you. One commercial. <laughs> Connexus Consulting is an engineering consulting firm. We focus on uh, chemicals and stored energy. We're, we basically are a process safety or technical safety company, engineering consulting firm. Um, we work with a lot of uh, EPCs. We work with a lot of end users. People like us because we stay in our lane, so to speak. Uh, we do the engineering consultant. We don't consulting. We do not do uh, installation or configuration in any way, shape, or form. So we focus on basically the industries you see there, the oil and gas industries, the chemical manufacturing. We do a lot of work with the national laboratories, uh, which is pretty cool in the United States anyway. Uh, outside the United States, we've really not been asked to work on any labs, but uh, in the U.S., we do a lot of work with um, places like Oak Ridge National Laboratories. We've done work at Idaho National Labs and some other labs that uh, will remain unmentioned. In the last four years, we've done a lot of work in energy storage facilities and vehicle test centers, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger deal. We drive process safety improvements through the organizations like the International Society of Automation, and consequently, we end up working with the IEC a lot globally. A lot of the process safety standards and cybersecurity standards have come international through the IEC. We also work with the American Petroleum Institute and with universities like Texas A&M's Process Safety Center, the Mary Kay O'Connor Center, and um, the Purdue Process Safety Center. I didn't name that correctly, but uh, it's at the University of Purdue in Indiana. And those places are, are uh, basically guys with PhDs and grad students working on their PhDs, uh, doing research into some of these areas that we find uh, very interesting. And so we interact with them a lot. We're a privately held company, and you can see some of the pictures up here, some of the stuff we've been working with. The energy storage thing, a lot of that is basically packing batteries into tight spaces or 
doing unique new types of generation inside of buildings that weren't designed for that particular type of gas typically or or generation equipment uh hydrogen electric vehicles and battery powered vehicles and the test centers for those and stuff it's it's a pretty big deal the cool thing is is outside if you have a hydrogen leak you pretty much know what's going to happen right so hydrogen might actually be a safer refueling thing than gasoline quite frankly because the flame's just going to go straight up as long as you don't have some other problem like the tank exploding or something, but it's, as long as the flame shoots straight up uh, following the hydrogen into the sky, we're in pretty good shape. The problem is, is when we take it and put it inside of a confined space, then we have problems. So let's just real quick before we get real deep into this, let's talk just briefly, because I'm going to use some of these words. So fire and gas systems, uh, basically designed to do fast and reliable detection of either a gas cloud, gas accumulation, or fire at its incipient stage, if possible, to reduce the magnitude of the of the problem. And then fire and gas mapping is where we define performance targets and then we design a system to meet those performance targets and verify that those performance targets are met. So when I say fire and gas system, you know what I'm talking about. When I say fire and gas mapping, you know what I'm talking about. Basically the mapping is the engineering process to design where the detectors should go, and how they should work and all that kind of stuff. And then the fire and gas system effectiveness is uh, basically uh, just like in the process safety world, we work on probability of failure on demand. We want to have the same kind of calculation here uh, so that if we, if the system can actually detect the problem, we want to make sure that it has a really high likelihood of actually doing it. Really nice looking building over there. The problem we have is that um, the building and fire codes all over the world they're really designed assuming that you're going to use the building within a reasonable area, right? You're going to use the building like buildings are typically used. <laughs> and so what happens is when you start changing the use of that building, so let's say that building doesn't have a lobby and it doesn't have office spaces in it, it doesn't have a break room and stuff like that. Now that building's basically a giant process center and you've got a bunch of equipment and gases running in there, that building really isn't designed and the building codes don't really fit using the building that way. Now, when you look at all these regulations, what you'll find out is there's typically some statement in there, in the regulation itself, whatever the regulation's called, there's something in there that says something about um, a local authority. Whoever the local authority is has the ability to say, hey, we're kind of outside of our jurisdiction here. Let's get somebody else to help us. And so that's where a company like Connexus comes in to do work to basically resolve what's going to happen if something goes horribly wrong in here and how do we prevent that from happening, uh, you know, at least reduce the risk as much as possible. And then if it does happen, what's going to happen to the building, right? And so those are things we do. We even do uh, site assessments. So when you put that kind of stuff inside of the building, the building changes basically. All right, so this is a, uh, um, I'm, I'm just jumping right into this because it's kind of cool. This is a hydrogen leak and a hydrogen electric vehicle testing facility. Um, when we do this work, we actually design the space, the volume, if you will. Um, and so you can see the equipment in there. Uh, you can see what the space looks like. And in this case, there's no airflow. Uh, everything's in a static condition. You just have a hydrogen leak. And it's doing pretty much exactly what you would think it would do. It actually is rising up to the ceiling and spreading across the ceiling and it will eventually fill the ceiling and then start working its way down into the room. The problem with hydrogen is it doesn't take a whole lot of it to become flammable and it, it has an extremely fast flame rate when it does ignite and it doesn't have as much energy as the hydrocarbons do in natural gas but it's still it's still a dangerous gas. We have to treat it with respect and um, that's the problem is because uh, hydrogen is so easy to deal with. A lot of people are kind of taking it for granted, and that's a little bit scary. So this is, um, you can see the air handling equipment now in the same space turning on. And so these are things we design. So we design the leak, we design the airflow, and we do it based on the characteristics of the building. So we ask questions up front about, hey, how's this building built? What's it look like? What's its shape? Uh, what size ducts does it have going in and out of the building? What's the airflow look like? And so this is a pretty sophisticated building with a good air wash system. And so that's the airflow, if you will. Um, so no hydrogen here, just a, you know, the rate of airflow in the space that you can actually see. 
In this space, we're going to let it run for a while. It's actually been running and it's saturated the space pretty well. And now we actually have the hydrogen leak occurring again in the same location. You can see it going up and hitting the ceiling and it will actually disperse a little quicker uh, because of the airflow in the space. But the airflow at the roof is different than the airflow down at the floor. And so the hydrogen is going to build up in the roof and it's building up. Strangely enough, those rafters are actually open, but it's still building up against the ceiling and rolling around. And so um, it just gives you an idea of what this is, what these kind of things look like when they happen and the stuff that we go through. So we look at where do you put a detector? Uh, do you need to change the airflow in the space? Do you need to, you know, how do you alarm? What do you do when it happens? How do you ev evacuate the atmosphere or the gas uh, when it happens? Stuff like that. So things to think about, even if necessary, even making recommendations about things like uh, we're not going to tell you what size or type of blow wall to put in, but the possibility that you might need to actually add some other thing to the structure to prevent it from causing greater problem. So the local, local authority recognizes as a problem, then what do you do, right? They, they basically say, hey, look, you, you did some stuff to this building we don't understand, and we need you to maybe do something else. So one of the challenges is you start looking at regulations and standards and all the recommended practices that are out there, and you realize these are really general guidelines, right? This is like what you would do for a shopping mall or what you would do for a grocery store or what you would do for an apartment building, but it doesn't really apply to my to my building because now I built an HEV test center in here or I'm testing engines inside of here and I built these little labs, but now I'm pumping hydrogen into the building at a much higher rate than we ever expected to do. What does that do to the building itself? And so the challenge is finding a way to make that fit. We'll, we'll get to that, I promise. But some of the difficulties is that people really struggle with, where do I put the detector? So a lot of you just looked at that last picture and went, well, I'm just going to put the detector up near the ceiling and we'll be done with this. Yeah, maybe. And in some cases, that's the right thing to do. In other cases, it's not, which is very odd because it really depends on the eddy currents and the um, computational fluid dynamics, the things that are going on, uh, the airflow in the space, how it's designed. And a lot of spaces don't have an air wash system like the one I just showed you. They, they have something else, and I'll show you some of that in a minute. The challenge we face is that people have a really bad habit of relying on their judgment or rule of thumb type behaviors. It is amazing how many facilities I've gone into and I've asked people, well, why did you put that gas detector there or that fire detector there? And they look at me and they go, but well, I don't know, let's go ask the oldest guy at the place and see why they did it. And then the old guy looks up from his cup of coffee in a break room and he goes, I think we put it on that stanchion because there was electricity there. Not a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a prudent answer right? and a fair answer, but not the right answer, right? We don't put things where it's easiest. We put things where it needs to be to de detect the leak as early as possible so that we don't have a problem. The other challenge that we find is that we'll go to a facility, and, and if you do this all the time, over and over and over again, eventually the facilities start to look, some of them look like other facilities, right? And so everybody thinks they're unique and they built something unique. But in reality, we buy a lot of the processes that we buy. We buy from the same vendors um, that have designed those processes and we have them installed and configured and, and whether you lease it or whatever you do to get it. And the equipment is very similar. And what we'll find is we'll go to one facility and they'll go, hey, you know, we have 100 detectors in our facility and and we'd kind of like to reduce the amount. And you go to the next facility and they're like, we have 500 detectors and we think we need more. It, none of it's based on science. Uh, that's a problem. So we, we've got to be fair about, you know, the way we make these kind of decisions. The other thing is, is that we get called and, and I've actually gone out to a site. I, I'm going to talk about the first one here, unable to detect a hazard. So in, in this case, there's a piece of equipment you see on the right, which I just simply drew in PowerPoint, um, mainly because they wouldn't let me take a photograph of it. But basically, it's a, a very high pressure process on a skid and um, it's out in the open air. Uh, at a facility down in Texas somewhere, and um, they put they put detectors uh, on the skid based on a prescriptive model that the owner of the facility had designed at headquarters, and they basically said, "Oh, that skid gets four detectors," and somebody said, "Okay, 
where do we put the detectors? And somebody made a decision to put them on the corners where the skid had stanchions to put them. And they put them there and everything was fine. But they had actually replaced these detectors with brand new state-of-the-art technology from a company that begins with an H. And it was really cool technology. It literally was, it is really in reality, some of the best detectors uh, ever built. It overcame a lot of the older limitations, really great gas detection system. And they had a leak and the leak occurred on a flange on this high pressure system, very high pressure system, several thousand pounds. And it shot gas out into the facility and none of those four detectors alarmed. As a matter of fact, detectors, the old detectors in other parts of the facility began to alarm. And these actually, the ones on the skid never went into alarm. And the reason they never went into alarm is that high pressure steam stream shot between the detectors and it actually created a Venturi effect in the atmosphere. It sucked fresh air in around it and behind it. And so those detectors, not only did they never detect the gas, they had no chance to it because they were basically getting clean, fresh air sucked in around that stream that was flushing the detectors. And so, you know, this kind of stuff happens and it drives people a little crazy, uh, but this is a perfect case of where the detectors were placed too close to the process. And if they had just moved these things out about 15 to 20 feet, they would have gone into alarm. The other thing is spurious alarms. So we get called every now and then for really weird things. I'm just going to pop a little tag up there and it's wiggling because, um, you know, people will call us and they'll say, hey, you know, um, that fire system you designed, for instance, is going into alarm and we don't know why. So we've taken it out of its ability to do anything automatically and we're in manual control and we're constantly overriding the alarms now and basically gotten to a point where we're ignoring them and that's not safe either. So what's up? And we'll go out and we'll find something like shiny new tags that they put on all the equipment. <laughs> and they're they're basically flickering around in the sunlight or the sunlight's hitting them and reflecting and a, and a detector's going off. And so the same thing happens with gas detectors sometimes is, you know, different scenarios, you just find these little weird things that happen. And, and the really bad problem with that is what we do next, right? So if you're operating a facility, company in, uh, uh, another company down in the Permian Basin called me and they said, hey, we just built this brand new plant out here and it's all brand new and it's beautiful and it's gorgeous. And I popped it up on a satellite view and I could actually see it. And I'm like, wow, that's really impressive. That's a lot of really shiny metal. And the guy goes, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you just told me earlier that all your fire detectors are going off all the time. And it's driving you nuts. And I said, I just looked at your facility and I said, all I can see from the satellite image is a whole bunch of shiny metal all over the place. And the guy goes, yeah, what's that got to do with anything? And I said, well, you probably have infrared detectors and you got some spread spectrum type uh, visual detection going on. And it's basically seeing the sunlight reflecting off of your pipes. And they put their system in manual activation, too. And they did it because of the spurious stuff. And it's like, well, let's think this through. Is there another way to solve the problem? And, and maybe we need to replace some of the detector technology. Do you really want to take it and completely rely on an operator to put it into an alarm and action state? So stuff to think about. So here's a place where judgments and rule of thumb drive me crazy. So what size area, just think about this, what size area does a gas detector sense? And depending upon where you got your education, what school you were in or whatever, you may have walked away with the conclusion that there is actually a distance around a gas detector that it can sense. I hear this a lot in the Middle East. I've heard it a lot in some of the uh, Asian countries. And it comes from the reason they've drawn this conclusion is because after the Piper Alpha accident in the North Sea, the UK health and safety executive in Aberdeen, Scotland, did a whole bunch of research and they determined that, that if a gas cloud got to be a certain size and it ignited, it would create too great a pressure wall and it would cause too much damage. It could really hurt people and kill people and stuff like that, or blow them off the platform and things of that nature. So it was like, okay, so they basically came back and they said, that cloud really can't be any bigger than uh, X, right? Whatever that number is. And everybody went, OK, we agree. And so they basically said we need to put detectors in a distance, in a, in a grid, if you will, so that the hypotenuse is no greater than, than X, so that we'll always detect a gas cloud. 
Now, I can tell you years and years and years of operation that those gas detectors detect somewhere around 20 to 30 percent of the gas leaks and miss a whole bunch of them. And the reason being is, is that nothing is a perfect shape and that's just not the way it works, unfortunately. The really bad news is if you were reading while I was talking across the header, you'll notice that nowhere in there does it say anything about the size of gas cloud it can sense. As a matter of fact, if you read across there, there's gas default range, selectable full scale range, resolution, and then there's two columns, one for T50s and one for T90s called response time. Well, wait a minute, <laughs> what does that mean? And if we go down to the hydrogen line, which I conveniently drew a line underneath of across the screen, we see that this could take up to 185 seconds if that gas cloud is actually right on that sensor for that long. If that gas cloud only is there for a little bit and then it passes away, that thing may never go into alarm. 185 seconds, can you imagine that, right? So these are things we have to take into account and we just can't make assumptions. The clouds never look like that one in the picture. That would be really cool if they did, but they don't, and they don't have any defined size. They carry all kinds of characteristics. So, um, Gas detectors really don't have an effective range, even though people think they do. They believe that leaks inside the range will be detected, and the reality is that's just not true. It's the very bottom of that little detector you see there. That little thing has to have gas up against it for some period of time for it to go into alarm at a high enough concentration for it to detect the gas. If we place the detectors really close to the leak source, and I see this all the time, I'll put one on either side of the leak source, north, south, east, west, whatever they do. It's frustrating, right? So one of the challenges you face is if you have a gas leak, sometimes depend upon the pressure of the gas, the material, the material in containment, the gas may take a long time to just get to the height that the detectors were placed at, right? And so it's just, it's really frustrating. And then we place detectors for dense gases near the floor and detectors for buoyant gases in an elevated location or near the ceiling. Okay, I, I, you know what? If you have no knowledge of anything, then it kind of makes sense. But the reality is that doesn't really work either because you have a prime mover in the space, uh, inside of an enclosed space, you typically have a prime mover and it's the air circulation system. So a couple of facts, heuristics, uh, that rule of thumb is what heuristics mean. So rule of thumb, they're available, but they almost always fall short of optimal design due to extension beyond applicable situations. They're just not, right? So that's what that's what the building codes are. It's they're, they were probably designed using this same type of technology, these same type of methods, but the reality is, is that if you change the building's function, then they may not work. Uh, results can be ineffective and expensive. Oh my goodness. There, there are companies who actually pay us to reevaluate an offshore platform and to reduce the amount of detectors that are on the platform if at all, if at all possible. Because <laughs> nobody really thinks about it. You put them in on a grid, you know, some company in the middle of nowhere gets wins the lowest bid and they're like, look, we're going to put them on a five meter grid, period. That's what we're going to do. And they put these detectors all over the place at about every 15 feet. And everybody's like, fantastic. And then, you know, 10 years later, they realize that they've wasted a huge portion of their life maintaining these detectors uh, at great cost, too. So performance-based analysis is, um, or engineering, if you will, is preferred. Um, and it is becoming more and more of a standard globally. Uh, so that's why you guys are on this call, which is very cool. So is there a standard? So in the United States, there's an organization called OSHA, but the OSHA 19 standard, 1910 standard, OSHA is designed to protect workers basically. And the, the standard is the process safety management of highly hazardous chemicals, right? And so you can define those to be basically what is listed there. And it's a, that's a good list. It's very encompassing. In uh, a long time ago, the standard came out in 1996. But the ISA, International Society of Automation in the United States, worked very hard in a committee called the IC 84 Committee. And that, that committee still exists. And, and disclosure, I'm actually a non-voting member of that committee, and I've worked on some of the standards in that, in that group. But they created the ISA 84 
uh, standard and published it after review in 1996. So this is a standard created by a large body of people who are experts in the field, if you will, experienced, and it's a consensus-based standard by those experts. And it is the application of safety instrument systems for process industries, which is all about keeping stuff in containment and, and reducing you know, the, the hazard, if you will. So and OSHA endorsed it and said, hey, this is fantastic. Um, the IEC adopted it globally. It's now called the ISA IEC 61511 standard. And those two groups work together very closely and it, it works. It's actually really cool. There's also a standard for cybersecurity called the 62443 standard and the ISA, ISA and the IEC work together on that. The ISA does most of the development. The IEC does review and basically puts their stamp on it and says, we agree and publishes it globally for everybody else. The ISA 84 standards body in 2006 went, hey, something's not working right. So people basically showed up and started asking questions about the things we've been talking about. They realized this too. And so some companies were like, you know what, we're just going to do a QRA on the whole system and we're going to figure out what we need. And the, and the result was wow, that's really expensive. It's going to cost millions of dollars just to do the research to figure out where we should put detectors doing it a QRA method. And so the reality was they sat down, they formed a working group, uh, working group seven. Working group seven set out to solve the problem. And they basically published a standard in 2010 called, uh, it's actually not a standard, it's a technical report. Uh, that's why the TR is there. It's Technical Report 84. I'm just going to call it .07. It's the guidance on the evaluation of fire, combustible gas, and toxic gas system effectiveness. And it was revised in 2018, just recently, actually, not too long ago. I mean, this is a this is a very serious effort to put science and engineering principles to a complex problem. So 1910 is focused on preventing the release. TR-8407 is focused on mitigation once the release occurs, all right? So that's the demarcation line, if you will, as you can see in the graphic there. So sorry for such a onerous graphic, but it makes it very clear. Gas gets out of containment, bad things happen. Gas stays in containment, good things, you know, that's where we want to stay. The technical report um, is informative, does not contain mandatory requirements. So why should I use it, right? That would be the first thing I would think is, well, well, basically, this is a group, this is a consensus group that has said, hey, here are the good engineering practices applicable to fire and gas system installations that you should be looking at. So they basically have gone to a great deal of effort to figure this out. And having worked in other standards bodies and worked in the ISA standards bodies, this is a good method. It, it's probably the best method for coming up with a consensus-based standard that makes sense. They put a lot of energy into creating this thing and they continue to make it better and do research in this space. It does expect an understanding of the risk analysis methods used in the process safety standard or the technical safety standard. It describes performance-based design to address the risk of lost containment. So basically, how are we going to do this, right? So, and we just call this performance-based design and engineers all understand this. Uh, provides examples. That's very cool. The, the examples, especially in the, in the 2018 version, go into qualitative, semi-qualitative and quantitative. They run the gambit, right? Qualitative always being a little bit sometimes too close to a rule of thumb. You got to be a little careful there, but we're taking a hard look at it addresses detector coverage, safety availability, and the mitigation effectiveness. That's fantastic. It does recommend periodic assessments. I can tell you very few companies do this, unfortunately. Uh, at some point, the number of accidents, uh, the number of accidents just continues to, um, it, it's not getting less, unfortunately. It doesn't replace safety instrumented functions in any way, shape, or form, even though it is related to it in a mitigative state. It is not designed to impact the preventative function of safety functions, period. It's consistent with the principles uh, that are defined in 61511 standard, and it recognizes that its goal, the whole FGS idea, if you will, is to reduce the severity when containment occurs or when loss of containment occurs. The guidance on the system basically demonstrates how to examine the hazard and risk, how to establish a performance requirement, 
how to design a system to meet the performance requirement and assess the detector coverage and assess system effectiveness. Now, I could easily just take the wording here and change it, and it would define what Connexus does when we do a project. So that's basically what we do. Mitigation, mitigation strategy and philosophy. So one of the challenges we face is that a lot of companies haven't thought this through to a point where they actually have a philosophy document. They have they have a risk number that they're willing to tolerate, right? A tolerable risk. But they haven't thought through to the point of saying, hey, what do we do if, right? So we take a look at a toxic gas scenario. Toxic gas is different for every application and general guidelines are difficult. Am I going to go through that stuff? We've kind of already covered all that, but let's look at what a statement might actually include. Now, we work with companies to develop these because, quite frankly, it's it, it's surprising how many companies don't have this. But, you know, you come up with, hey, what's the right amount of gas to detect? Well, 10% of IDLH, fixed gas detection might have PPA, PPE gas detection limits too, depending upon, in, especially in particular areas you find that, right? So you go into a facility and it's areas where you have to basically either have a mask on your hip uh, or even have a mask on in some cases. Here's something I find really fascinating. I have been to so many facilities around the world and I have never, ever in a safety training, they never talk about fixed detectors and portable detectors, right? So if you have personal protection equipment and and it goes into alarm, what do you do? If you go, if you're somewhere and the fixed detector goes into alarm, what do you do? And they don't ever talk about that, right? And so, you know, recognizing that in a case where you have a fixed detector and alarm, you need to train everybody, do not go into that area. And if you're in an area and your PPE goes into alarm, get out of the area. And I have never once ever had that in training. I love the guy, I had a security guy down, um, but he, he he gave me a tag and I put it on my uniform and and I or my uh, FR gear and I said, hey, what's this tag for? You know, a little detector tag, kind of like a um, a radiation detector. And I said, what chemical is this for? And he goes, oh, that's for phosgene. And I went, oh, okay. So if this is in alarm, um, the people who find my body will know what killed me. And he looked at me and went, what are you talking about? I said, well, if there's enough phosgene gas somewhere for that thing to change color, I'm already dead. So these are things that people just don't think about. All right, so you guys can read the other stuff. I'm gonna pop into the next slide. So what we do when we do this stuff is we need to analyze the hazard itself, um, define the target, things like that. We want to model the consequence. So in the upper right-hand corner, um, basically going through an exercise okay. to figure out, we went through the exercise to calculate what the risk was without the detection system and then um, that, basically for the area that they want to take a look at. Uh, and then later in the process, we'll go back and do that and make sure we'll review that and see what the number is then. Um, consequence modeling, you can see some of those in the bottom. Um, so the one in the middle in the bottom that shows the Gaussian uh, gas model, gas curves. Um, and then right below it, you can see the wind rows, which kind of looks like a a flower inside of a compass. You can get those from airports. Sometimes local facilities have them. Uh, they become much more readily available uh, over the years. What we do when we do outdoor facilities is we actually calculate the prime mover outdoors for the gas cloud is obviously the leak itself, but it's also wind and the prevailing wind direction. And that doesn't that only weights the analysis. It doesn't, it weights the analysis based off of probability, right? So how much of the year, in this case, the wind looks like it's coming from the Southwest. I'm just assuming top is North. It comes from the Southwest and, and the most of the year. And so basically um, the chance of that cloud being somewhere else is a little bit, or the wind being coming from a different direction is a little bit less. So this helps us weight how often the gas cloud is gonna be in a particular location. The drawings to the right are the, computer output from the right to the right shows a facility with actually natural gas compressors in it. And those natural gas compressors, there's a leak and you can see what's going on. You can see how the air handling equipment. So we model all of that stuff, model the consequence of the leak and where the leak's going to go and how it's going to behave so we can figure out where to put the detectors 
Uh, and this is all based on probability, statistics, stuff like that, right? It's, you're never going to get it. You can't solve every single problem. You just solve the majority of them uh, to make the place as safe as possible. You drove to work most likely today. You took a great risk driving to work, right? You took about a 10 to the minus fourth risk driving to work, which is basically the same risk you take when you work in these type of facilities, believe it or not. So something to think about, right? No intersection, no roads, perfect. Things happen. People do crazy things. We do a gas mapping or fire or gas mapping assessment. Um, we design where the detectors go, and then we make sure that everything works the way we expect it to work. So different types of things. We do grading. We don't want to have a ton of detectors, so we want detectors to work within a certain amount of time. You can see in the bottom left the fire and gas performance targets. Sometimes it's based on it's based on time to alarm. Sometimes it's based on the risk in an area, things like that. So all things to think about. Occasionally in a grade A area, people will say, hey, look, this is a, it's like a class one div one area. If you want to look at it from electrical perspective, you know, the probability of, of ignition is high. Uh, and the probability of a leak is is significant enough that you want to actually increase your detectors in a grade A area. Uh, and you want to put in enough detectors. You might even do a boating schema and put in quite a few more detectors than you normally would in a grade A area. But in a grade C area, you're going to put in as, you know, your, your chance of having a problem there is minimal. So that type of stuff, right? All of that effort goes into creating, in this case, we're just doing toxic. I should have done hydrogen. I apologize. But a toxic gas design basis. So we, we know we need to reduce the risk from 7.6 times 10 to the minus 2 to 1 times 10 to the minus 4. We want to design fire of, of 1 foot by 1 foot liquid hydrocarbon. It's going to generate roughly a 10 kilowatt radiant heat output fire. A design leak of 5 millimeters, about a little less than a quarter of an inch. It's a pressurized gas leak. We're going to we're going to pick an LEL for each one of the gases that could be there. In this case, propane, butane and, and asphyxiant. We're going to do the major equipment area grading. So where's the risk the greatest and where's at least and typically most places have two graded areas. Grade C, they sort of just ignore, but it's just something to think about. Right. You, you can have more than one graded area and you can have a grading is grading. Uh, voting schemas. These drive us nuts. They're hard to do, uh, but we do them. And then what do I do when an alarm occurs, right? And so how do I, what do I do? Do I do a, do I evacuate? Do I automatically initiate suppression? Even in a toxic gas leak, you might actually be spraying stuff into the air to atomize the gas to keep it from going out of the fence line. Uh, so there are weird, weird things you got to think through, right? Do I, do I shelter in place? Do I evacuate? All those things. So this is an outdoor application in a confined space, basically. But we we go through. We use what's called expert judgment, and we do scenario and geographic type analysis. And typically, when it comes to fire, we're doing geographic. When it comes to gas, we're doing scenario. What you see in the upper left hand corner is a Gaussian result uh, based on the pressure and the material that was in containment, escaping containment at the size. So let's say five millimeter. You'll notice at the very left-hand side of that, that there's a gap. So let's say this gas is heavier than air. And that little gap right there means that before the we're doing the analysis, we're taking this slice at the height of the detector. And you'll notice that there is some distance before the gas gets down to that detector. This happens a lot. We see a lot of gas leaks where people put the gas detector in the wrong place and the gas escapes and it doesn't get to the detector some other detector in the space hopefully goes into alarm um, we rotate that 360 degrees around the leak source we apply wind in the bottom left hand corner to it uh, which is just a weighting of the calculation it's not you know it just means the gas cloud has a, what you can see in the um, on the left hand side of the screen in the middle bottom is you can see that the yellow area is a higher risk than the light green area. So what that prevailing wind is doing, and it's backwards to the image you see on the left, the the, the gas is being pushed by the wind over in the corner. So the yellow area, instead of being radiating right around that pump skid, is actually moved off of that pump skid um, to the towards the bottom left of that image that you see there. 
On the right-hand side, offshore platform, actually the wellheads, um, and you can see the bubbles around the gas detectors. And this is why people think the engineering world, if you will, and the software world, they draw the bubbles around there uh, for a reason. Um, it has to do with gas cloud comes into that bubble and enough of it is in the bubble that the cloud actually covers the detector. Then we can assume that the detector detected it. Uh, the reality is gas clouds never look like that, that, that pinkish one there. Um, they move off through here in erratic behaviors and they don't, they don't tend to stay on a detector very long. And this is why the UK Health and Safety Executive has discovered that five square meter grids a little bit challenging and um, maybe needs to be rethought. It's amazing how many times people from Europe somewhere are on these calls uh, because there's research going on uh, and they're trying to figure out what to do next too. All right. The reason expert adjustment, trust me, if someday AI figures out how to do this better, um, engineers are still going to have to know. Um, if you ask, I don't know if you guys have done any of this, but if you do any experimentation and you ask the AI systems that are out there, whether you're using BARD or Chat GBT or any of the other ones, um, if you ask, uh, I think even Microsoft's uh, Edge now has an AI engine built into the search engine. Um, but if you ask uh, AI an engineering question, it's amazing how bad the answers are sometimes. So a lot of judgment that needs to go into this. They're, they're, you know, they're searching the internet and they're just giving you a result like the search would and search would, but doing it in a plain English type, uh, plain language type model. Uh, so you got to really look at this stuff. Um, we are doing research in this area with the universities, hoping to get to a point where they can do more of this for us. I would be very cautious of any software that says it can do this for you, um, because the reality is uh, this is a, I, I, I'm very, I would be very judgmental here and say, I don't believe it, prove it. I want to see the mathematics. And the reason being is weird things happen, just like this gas cloud right here. Its initial travel is perpendicular to release, and then it's going to change shape. As a matter of fact, as it hits more and more atmosphere, once the energy has begun to dissipate, it will start to pancake and change shape, right? So, and you can see if you put a gas detector real close to that gray object that's sticking up there where the gas leak is coming from, uh, if you put it real close to that and it's at the height that you expect that gas cloud to be at eventually, you're going to fail. The gas detector will not detect the gas. This happens inside of buildings too, right? So you got to think about the fact that it may take a detector a long time to go into alarm. If you put the gas detector in the wrong location, you're basically going to wait for the space to fill up with gas before you go into alarm. You know, you might be get a better result than that, but the reality is you don't want to wait that long. The other thing that happens is as the gas leak goes on further, um, it begins to become, in this case, it's buoyant, right? So the gas cloud is not only as it's hitting the airflow, now we're in this position where the gas cloud is actually starting to rise. And so now this could very easily be a hydrogen leak, right? So the hydrogen leak, depending upon the momentum coming out of the leak, the direction the leak has, how will it behave and what distance will it be before it actually goes up? Uh, what distance will it be from the from the leak source itself before you can detect it consistently? Things like that. Outdoors, uh, so HVAC systems have a huge impact on this. People always ask me, well, why are you asking about our air handling equipment? Well, because the reality is I need to know what the building looks like. I need to know what the air handling equipment can do because it's gonna have a huge impact on the gas cloud eventually. So that very same gas cloud at some point is gonna lose enough momentum that the wind's gonna overtake it and start pushing it the direction the green arrow is showing. Or in this case, it might be air handling equipment would push it in a different direction or pull it in a different direction. Uh, I kind of already talked about placing detectors too close to the leak source. So in, sometimes when you run the Gaussian modeling, what you'll find is that the model will actually go in the other direction. Instead of being negative, the gas cloud will actually be positive at the axis where the, the little yellow point is at the bottom. And what that is, is the gas is basically being released and pointed down probably towards an obstacle or the ground, uh, or pointed towards an obstacle or pointed towards the ground. So what's happening is the gas basically is billowing instantly as it comes out and creating a cloud there locally and then moving off. It's, it's interesting because you know, you just don't know. You got to kind of go through the process. 
So people ask us about geographic and scenarios. So everybody always wants to do geographic because they can do it with a they can do it with a calculator or, or a, a grid map or something like that, right? And so the challenge with geographic is if you put a detector right on that leak where the little uh, location of detector not intersected by any of the gas releases is pointing to that little green detector on the top of that stack, whatever it is. And you did a calculation geographically, it would tell you that it detects 100% of the gas clouds. And it's probably never going to detect any. And the reason being is because there's always a prevailing wind. The gas is going to always go in a different direction. The gas is under pressure, so it's always going to go in a different direction. So, so geographic coverage can fail you drastically. Uh, so it's just things you got to think about. So gas is almost always analyzed using some scenario modeling, which is um, what you see on the left-hand side is scenario modeling where we have a gas leak and then we're applying wind to it and it's moving around and we're creating areas, uh, the yellow areas, the, the more heat in the coloring, <clears throat> the greater the gas concentration and the greater the probability the gas will be there. And then the less heat in an area like the white area is basically the chance of gas being there pretty close to zero. So in the right is actually geographic coverage and geographic coverage actually works very well for fire in most cases. A jet fire would be an exception, uh, but geographic coverage works pretty well in just about every other case. So pretty interesting how using, you know, we like scenario coverage. Uh, we think scenario coverage is definitely state of the art for gas, but in reality in fire, geographic tends to work a little bit better. Um, but then you're back to that expert thing, knowing where that line is. How do you make a decision? So we move inside a building. We say, hey, we're going to use a scenario method, and it's an indoor space. So what we're really doing is we're modeling the space, modeling the airflow. We use the National Institute of Standards uh, Fire Design Simulator. We actually have a, a massive cluster of Linux computers that run that here in our shop, our engineering offices in Columbus, Ohio. And um, what that cluster of computers does, and I don't remember how many computers there are in it now. So basically, these computers are designed to run at 100% capacity, 100% of your CPU utilization indefinitely. But the reality is what we create is we create a consequence model like you see on the right. So at the top one, all we've done is we've run the heating and air conditioning system so you can see how the ventilation works. So each one of those compressors is generating heat. It's got a hot spot. The heat moves off. Uh, with the airflow, a heat concentrates up near where the air handling equipment is actually taking the heat out of the space. When you have a gas leak, that will have an impact on it, right? So in the very first one in the five meter leak, we have a methane leak. It's an isosurface. So basically, we sliced the system to take a look at it. And or the, I'm sorry, the system is three dimensional. It's an isosurface. We can actually see what the cloud looks like in the, in the simulator, if you will. And the gas clouds are moving off towards the ventilation system. In a bigger leak, we have more gas uh, in the space uh, very quickly. And yeah, so I, I apologize. The leak on top, that is the five millimeter and the one at the bottom. The one at the bottom has just been running longer. So the air handling equipment's not taking it out. And then the last one with the pink isosurface is actually um, a larger leak. And you can see how big the gas cloud gets really quick. And, um, you know, methane's concentrating down around the floor, down around other heat sources, things like that. So. And then in the bottom right, you can actually see um, the same five millimeter and the 25 millimeter leak and what those look like when we take a slice and we're just looking at um, the gas in the space, what residues left. And you can see the one up here, the five millimeter in the, uh, on the bottom of the two, very similar to the one you see down here at the five millimeter leak. And you can see the ISO surface versus the heat map down below too. It gives you an idea how it works. Sometimes we're just really surprised by the results. It's it's a, it's an interesting process to go through. So the other thing we look at is, and this is actually for that little skid you saw me putting up earlier. That skid was in a buffer room using acidic acid. And what we wanted to do is detect it. And what, we, what we've done is we've put in three detectors and we're basically taking the gas detection, you know, based on where we thought they should be, and then time to alarm is is calculated here based on the gas concentration. And some of these just don't go into alarm, right? It's an interesting process to go through. So basically you have about 33, 34 seconds, maybe 35 seconds before the detector, one of the detectors will go into alarm. So things to think about. This is a different 
application here we're looking at oxygen depletion in a space so an asphyxiation hazard and the detectors where we designed them to go uh, we're basically running the same running this type of analysis based on the detectors and what that level of gas will be in those spaces uh, or i mean sorry the level of oxygen in those spaces and how much of it will be depleted you can tell right about here people are starting to get really dozy all right, at about that level, at about about 18, 19 percent, you're gonna have, your eyelids are gonna get really heavy. You're gonna start having trouble staying awake, and then you're going to basically start having trouble staying alive in the space if it continues. All right, so time to alarm is uh, significant in some cases, and some something to think about, right? So that lack of oxygen, basically, that person's already gotten really sleepy on alarm. You may want people with forced air in the space to get anybody who's in the space out because uh, they may have already gone to sleep. All right. So this is what uh, this is just the scenario method we did for um, a, a customer. A lot of the you, you can't really tell anything about it other than it's a room. Uh, there's a big door on the left hand side that I think you can see my mouse that's over here. The air handling equipment is pushing air into the room right here and it's pushing air into the room right here. The difference between the two is the, the room on the left is low in the same period of time and the room on the right is high. So when the airflow is set to high, the air actually goes over and hits the opposite wall and causes a significant eddy, eddy current within that period of time, whatever that period of time is. And then in this case over here, it takes, and this is velocity per meter second, or yeah, in meter second per second. And over here, it takes longer and doesn't really create that eddy. And then what's happening is you can actually see the airflow is creating an eddy. It's coming down and bouncing across the floor. Pretty cool fluid flow dynamics type uh, diagram. And then what's happening, and the reason this is blue here is the air is actually going back out of the room. In this case, it's not actually clearing the air so much on this wall back here, but it's moving out the open space. So openings in the space become really important for us. So in this case, we're actually doing um, acetylene. And so we have an acetylene leak. Um, it is low on the left and high speed on the right. And I'll let them build up for you so you can see them. And you'll see that these leaks have very similar characteristics regardless of the airflow. And it's partly because of where the leak source is in the space. So here we had that high speed air coming in, but it only goes about this far and then it starts to move out the room. We had high speed air coming in, creating an eddy currents on the floor and the ceiling over here and obviously on the walls too. But the neither one of them seemed to have a real big impact on the acetylene cloud. So pretty easy decision about where to put a detector in that case. So now we're gonna move to argon. So argon's a pretty cool gas, um, pretty heavy. Uh, not everybody uses argon, but it's out there. And you can see in low and in high that it just sort of spills out and dissipates, right? So it's basically spilling out on the floor and dissipating. So we can figure out where to put the detector pretty easily. And it would depend on, you know, where on that piece of equipment the leak's most likely to occur. But you might have to put multiple detectors in because, you know, the leak's not going to go anywhere, right? So putting a detector on the wall here would be like a really bad idea unless it was right down there in that gas. So things to think about. Hydrogen, lighter than air, right? So there it goes, it pops up, you know, very, very tiny molecule, smallest molecule. And hydrogen in low flow actually builds up pretty quick in the space. Uh, and you can see that on the left and the right, hydrogen leak is being disturbed very much by the air handling equipment. And so these are things, again, to think about, where do you put the detector, all right? Nitrogen. It is amazing how many people think nitrogen is not a hazard. I worked in a shipyard. The really interesting thing that I learned there was nitrogen is very, very dangerous. Uh, and one of the reasons was we used to put nitrogen purges on tanks. And um, you could put a nitrogen purge on a tank and, and leave a hatch open on it. Uh, depending upon where it was at, and it would displace the oxygen in the space. And as long as there was no airflow, no significant airflow at all, the nitrogen would just stay in there indefinitely. Um, I, obviously not forever and ever, but um, long enough for somebody to crawl in there and take a permanent nap. So the challenge 
in the shipyard was they had signs that had words on them. And unfortunately, a lot of people that were uh, janitorial services in the shipyard, if you will, people were picking up nuts and bolts and pushing brooms and things like that. They couldn't read. And so eventually the shipyard had to change to signs that had pictures of people grabbing their neck with a really pained look on their face and, you know, write big words and letters called choke hazard and redo training for everybody so that people wouldn't go in these tanks and kill themselves um, unknowingly. And so nitrogen's a big deal, uh, depending upon the leak. In this particular case, nitrogen, it was a relatively small amount of it, and its chance of overcoming somebody in the room was pretty small, except let's assume this is a laboratory environment and somebody's bending over there to actually get something out from underneath a shelf or do some work. Um, in that case, they could actually take a few breaths of nitrogen, not get oxygen in their lungs at all, become very lightheaded and fall out. Now, the good news is, is wherever they fall out, maybe their nervous system will take over and they'll keep breathing. But the reality is, is that yeah, you don't want that to happen, right? You got to think that stuff through too. Verifying availability, um, quantitative verifications performed using the guidance uh, from the 61511 standard. Uh, basically, what we're doing is complement of probability of failure on demand. Will this thing work? So, and so we just basically come up with the mathematics. Uh, no rocket science here. You're going to look at the system. You're going to look at the the sensors, the logic controller, and the final elements. Uh, you're going to do a calculation to verify whether or not that thing will actually work. If that's acceptable, because there's a certain amount of time it won't work, right? And depending upon what kind of equipment it is and what kind of, you know, valves fail, things don't activate. Unfortunately, a lot of these safety systems sit for years and never get cycled. Um, so treating them a little bit differently and checking to make sure that they work, probably a good idea. So then we... Uh, we evaluate effectiveness too. So evaluating effectiveness, what we're gonna do is go back down. We're gonna say, okay, we put a system in, how did that change the system? Well, you can see how I did the math, right? So the places where the answer was zero, now there's another number there. Uh, places where the answer was, you know, bad, there's a number there, right? And so all these things get figured out based off of what you're doing and what you've done to overcome the problem. And there are standards for this stuff that is, is reasonable and recalculate the same thing we did in the beginning. So we needed to get from 3.75 times 10 to the minus fourth to better than that. And we got to 7.63 times 10 to the minus fifth. So those are, and obviously when we do consulting engineering, that's actually, you know, you're going to have a dialogue with a customer about this stuff and the customer is going to either agree or disagree to it. And then all that stuff we did the previous slide on, this slide on is this equipment over here, right? So the, the equipment that's involved in the system to make it happen. And then once it actually does, so I have gas detector coverage, I have fire gas system availability for gas, I have an ignition source, I have fire, I have a fire system. You know, I have, this is the same, the consequence is the same. Um, occupational fatality, if they're in those spaces, there's a risk there, it's not going away. But what does change is the frequency of that happening. Uh, because of the other equipment. So you can tell people to get out, the equipment can engage, things like that, right? Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, same thing's true inside and outside of a space. So outside, you know, doing outside airspaces, we do it that way inside. Uh, it's the same thing, same type of calculations. Fire and gas mapping reporting. Um, we give people really nice pictures of what's going on. This is actually our own software. So we know all the mathematics that are in it. Um, we have patents on some of the stuff in here because nobody else can figure out how to do it. Um, and so uh, it's, it's kind of cool. And under an NDA, we can actually show you how the mathematics work. Uh, but basically, we're going to come in and tell you where the detectors go, what rate, you know, it, some weird stuff. Remember that that expert judgment? Instead of picking to place a detector up in the air somewhere on a pole, no, no, no. We've got a handrail right there. Let's put it right there on the handrail and see if we can. So now I don't have to get a ladder to do maintenance on it, right? So anything you can do in the expert judgment category to make things easier on people over time is valuable too. So you get all kinds of results from that. In gas scenario mapping, uh, oh, so this one's really cool. So this was a natural gas compressor station. And uh, they asked us to come out and do a uh, photogrammetry of the space. So in this particular case, we went in, we did the gas, uh, the gas analysis, we graded the situation. 
um, get back and, you know, where detectors go, what they're going to detect. That actually was fire. I apologize. That is actually not gas there. Those are fire detectors you can see. All right. So enough about Connexus. Uh, I think you guys know who we are. We've written books on the subject. Our website is uh, visited a lot, quite frankly. Um, you can see here's one of the patents we have um, uh, on effigy itself, which is pretty cool. We've written books. We're very active in all this stuff. Uh, we do teach an ISA course called the EC56P course, which is all about how to do this engineering in detail, um, which is good. This book from the ISA and this handbook from us, uh, the handbook needs to be revised. Probably the book from the ISA needs to be revised too. Those were originally written before the, uh, the new version of the TR8407 came out. Um, if you go up to connexus.com, you can ask questions. Uh, that's probably the one of the easiest ways to get a hold of us if you don't know who to talk to. Um, and then you can also go up here and go to the senior staff page, and it'll actually tell you who everybody is, including their uh, professional profile. And you can see what kind of experience they have to be classified as experts. The only people we put up there are senior staff, and everybody else that works here is under their supervision. That's it. That's all I got, guys.